All right, Mike with That's Good Enough For Me.com. We're doing our Who's Zoom and Who series. I'm pleased to be here with Sasha from Mad Caddies. How are you doing? Yo, what's happening? Oh, not much. Just living at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got House on Fire, which is coming out this Friday, uh, October 16th. This will be publishing uh, in a week or two. But I wanted to talk about the EP. I got a chance to listen to all five songs. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I really like the way the band has, has moved forward uh, to just timeless rock and roll music uh, mixed with some reggae. And I wanted to talk to you, I guess, with my first question about the production of it, because it sounds like a million bucks. Can you kind of go on with uh, how it was produced, where it was done, who engineered it, who produced it? Uh, th this one, Todd, uh, we recorded a lot a lot of it in uh, at our, our bass player Graham's house. And um, it, it took a while to put together just because, you know, it was done in kind of in different installments. Um, okay. it, it wasn't done in one, ch one chunk of time. But, uh, yeah, Todd is great. I mean, uh, we did all the sounds there, and he ended up mixing. Um, I, think he mixed, I think he mixed almost everything on it. Um, and, uh, I mean, it, you know, this, this should have come out a while ago. So, it, it, like, he, uh, it was good. He, he, he did a great job just with anything we almost had too much time you know some of these songs are now are like five years old you yeah, know got it. Uh, so, and, and so um so it, it just it's kind of weird that it's a new album because for us it feels like it's a bit old you know but uh yeah man Todd, todd's great at what he does so he uh he did a lot of the mixing and um he was he was there when we were tracking it and uh i i think the next time around we're, we'll, you know we'll probably do something similar but we're just gonna try to get it done a lot quicker Got it. Yeah, and I've talked to a lot of bands about uh, during COVID times, you know, holding on to records, eating records, <laughs> releasing records early, or, you know, uh, canceling uh, tours that were based off of record releases. So releases in general have been kind of strange. I didn't know where you guys were at with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, the same thing with Dirty Rice. You know, I, I kind of snicker to myself when you guys come out with records because a lot of punk bands are just becoming more and more fake sounding in the studio. Uh, when it comes to tuning up things or, you know, digitizing things, uh, the tones on the record, man, they're great. It sounds like a, a guitar amp sitting right next to you in person. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that's, that's been our goal, you know, and since, since we're not doing, you know, straight up like uh, punk rock stuff with some of the mid-tempo mid rock stuff, it's it, that's a good genre of music for really getting good tones, you know, especially with guitar, you know, like a lot of the reggae stuff, obviously the guitar is not the primary instrument. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the tones just aren't really, you know, you don't, you don't hear them as well because the you know, guitar is not in the, in the forefront as much, but, yeah. uh, and also too, when you're doing a lot of super fast punk rock stuff, it's sometimes the tone gets lost because there's so many, you know, the drums are going so crazy and it's the, the tempo is so hot. So this mid tempo rock stuff, I think is the best, um, just to sonically be able to kind of show what you know what you can do you know absolutely yeah the tone on uh, strange days that little bridge you have a little tasty guitar part in there mm -hmm. uh, that's excellent I, I wanted to point that out in particular uh, after listening to the five songs a few times yeah, uh, I think re recreating the album live was gonna be a little difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot of production to it but I, I think you'll be able to pull it off yeah uh, as someone that studies guitar players a, a little too hard, I've always followed your methodology, uh, how you uh, carefully decide what your different panned guitar parts are going to be. And then, of course, if you're going to add banjo and things like that on top of it, uh, you've, you've always done a really good job. But I think in, in the EP and in Dirty Rice and in, in the covers album, it's been uh, it's either been even more prominent or I am just that much more of a weirdo when I listen to your band. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's been here and there. We, we've tried, you know, like I said, we've had time to tinker with a lot of stuff. Uh, and Todd, especially, has had time to tinker with a lot um, on this last album. But as far as the other albums are concerned, um, yeah, I, th I think because because we don't get a – because we're not a guitar-driven rock band, you know, it's, kind of, it's, it's refreshing to kind of go into the studio with these songs and be able to do something that we don't normally do. You know, do, and so we we get to be creative in a different way that you can't. Like I said, you can't really be with like fast punk rock or you know reggae. Absolutely cool, cool. Uh, and I wanted to talk, uh, namely, 
uh, you guys have never worn a genre on your sleeve, so to speak, and that's something that I, I really like about the band, uh, is that you're willing to go all over the place and back again. So I, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, The Holiday Has Been Cancelled, uh, the EP that came out 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, also a five-song EP, has a lot more punk rock in it, uh, but let's go on, and, and, and I just kind of wanted to compare and contrast, obviously, uh, your position in the band and the band itself was in a completely different place 20 years ago. Could we talk about the production of that, uh, the gathering of those songs and the, and, and how that all went about? Oh man. Okay. That's a long time ago. So, um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be a hundred percent, uh, accurate, but as I recall, that was obviously done after duck and cover and we had a bunch of touring. We had done a bunch of touring at the time. And so as a band, you know, we were, we, we kept want, we wanted to keep on touring and we had some ideas that we wanted to get out and just put out, put out an album, you know, or put out an EP. And uh, I remember at the time we had also lost our bass player um, for a while. And so we were going through a member, we were going through getting a new bass player at the time, which mm-hmm. was uh, obviously not, not ideal in the middle, when you're in the middle of recording. So I remember that part of it being pretty stressful uh, I also remember, I'm pretty sure that we had uh, some strict due dates because we had to get back out on the road. Uh, at that time, we were doing a lot of touring, like on the Fat Records tours with No Use for Name and Good Riddance and the Ataris. And um, we, had, we had like three tours. No, I think, see, I, I, I don't remember the, the exact order. I think we, we, we recorded some of it and then we took a break and did some touring and then came back to it. I do remember that our the album title came from... Uh, I believe we were in Quebec City, and the rental, the rental RV that we had, um, the guys weren't that we had, we took it to get serviced on while we were on tour, and the guys weren't too happy with the condition of it, and they said the holiday has been canceled, and we just thought that was really funny because it was like in it was like in the middle of like February in in Quebec, you know, it was like yeah. snow, it was horrible out. And then we were just like, if if you think we're on a holiday right now, <laughs> you know, like, man, I don't know, I don't know what a, what a holiday looks like to you, but you know, we clearly weren't on a holiday. But I don't know, it was just funny. Uh, that's yeah, so that's where that's where the title came from. Um, and then as far as, um, I I only I only honestly right now can remember three of those songs on the album, maybe four. Yeah, and I'm gonna open them up because I don't have them in front of me. But what I what I the reason I wanted to bring it up in particular. Uh, is because for me as a fan of Duck and Cover and a fan of Quality Softcore, uh, this was just a little taste into how much further you guys were going to take the Dixie thing. Uh, and I predicted that. I expected that. So Falling Down is that epic yeah. Dixie intro uh, mm-hmm. with, with the ragtime at the beginning. Uh, Nobody Wins at the Laundromat, of course, is just an aggressive punk song, which I really like that song. Mm-hmm. That song was basically kind of for me as uh, like a thesis of what like the duck and cover era Mad Caddies can do uh, <laughs> as far as, you know, aggressive punk. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, SOS was uh, and, and Destro were the ones where you started to kind of step into really pretty intricate guitar parts uh, mm-hmm. that intertwine with the horns. I can't remember which one of those two has a really slow building intro to it and uh, it's sos probably well not, that, it's not really yeah it's pretty short but it's it's kind of more it's kind of mellow mm-hmm. um, so I, I i like that because that uh that bridge bridges the gap now as a, as a continual listener of the band uh from you know duck and cover to what you guys have become and then the different places that you've placed yourself in the introduction of a lot of piano driven stuff in in uh, dirty rice for example so uh i wanted to talk about that uh big fan of that and and of course uh as you said you did have some long-term members of the band that uh were kind of dropping off at that point as any band that had been around that long that was kind of the, the period that that happened but what i didn't know uh until i wikipedia you today was that your current drummer todd uh is the original drummer he was just gone for 10 years or something yes yes so i i was completely unaware of that i missed that uh and now it makes perfect sense when i think about the discography and, and just where the drums were uh as someone that kind of nerds out about that mm-hmm. uh cool okay 
Next, I wanted to touch on the covers album. I've read a little bit uh, about how it was kind of put together, but how did how did how did you guys go about choosing the cover songs that you ended up doing? Uh, it was uh, you know in the very beginning we had a list of songs. You know, I had, M- Mike and I went over a bunch of songs and a way to go about it because it's not just as simple as picking twelve songs. You know, there's certain songs. Uh, they just don't make good reggae songs. So it was kind of like we started off with going, okay, what bands do we want to do? All right, we know we want to do a Descendants one. We, we obviously mm-hmm. know we're going to do like a snuff song. There were certain bands that were, we were 100% sure that we wanted to do. Like I said, Descendants and Snuff were, were two big ones. And then there was other, you know, we didn't have, you know, didn't have like set out to do like a Green Day song, for example. Um, but, you know, certain songs just turned into better reggae songs than others. Uh, so that's kind of how that came about. So, uh, you know, we, 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 once we pick the band, we kind of go over a bunch of the different songs and uh, see which ones work the best, you know, um, just the ones that we picked just happened to be the best, that, the, the, the songs that made the best reggae songs. Um, they, they might not necessarily be our favorite song from that band, um, but they just, you know, some certain songs don't work. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, and then we also wanted to do, you know, we didn't want to do all like obscure songs. We wanted to do some songs that were more popular that maybe some people that weren't as big of punk rock fans uh, may, would know. Obviously, like the Green Day song. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we just didn't want to do a bunch of generic, you know, the hits of a bunch of punk rock bands. So, you know, it took a, kind of a while to pick the songs. And, you know, it, 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 took, about, it took only about five minutes to really, re- to, to really realize if it was going to uh, make a good reggae song or not. And then once we knew that it was going to be a good reggae song, then yeah, we just recorded it. Cool. Yeah, and I was a fan of. Uh, see, the, the the biggest problem, and I can say this to you since I'm I'm a long term fan of your band, doing these zooms uh, with different bands, I've learned uh, good, reputable punk bands that I've slept on. So like Bracket is a really good example. I got to do a zoom with them. And and uh, go further from saying like oh they're that band from that prop uh, from that uh, compilation that fat rat compilation as as uh, you know some of those bands go to the wayside so I was a big fan of uh, well I was a big fan of the bracket cover because I was able to go back because it was the only bracket song I knew before interviewing them uh, and then of course since then I've I've delved in a lot more what was the propagandi song choice your first choice what sorry. What was the propagandi song uh, your first choice? I, I assume you probably it's knew the you same kind of thing. We we picked a band like propagandi and we went through like eight songs and, and thought which ones would make the best reggae songs and that one uh, everyone you know liked the song. Everyone you know, everyone knows that song and it, it turned out to make a all right kind of mid tempo ska song. So um, you know there was other songs that we liked just as much, but they just didn't work. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, and I, I really liked Mike's cameo at the end of that, too. I mm-hmm. thought that that kind of, the, the, the ska sucks things that, that, that he added to the end kind of uh, sewed shut that entire legacy of, of like Fat Wreck Propagandi and, and where they stood and what they did for the label and their relationship with Mike and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I just found out that your long-term trumpet player uh, recently left the band. Uh, which is saddening, but it looks as, as if uh, the new the new guys on the new record, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I wanted. I wanted. There's, I wanted there's not, it's not too heavy on the horns, but he's a he's a phenomenal player. Hell yeah! And I assumed you wouldn't be filling those shoes with just anybody, but uh, I assume a band that's been around as long as you guys have been around, there's going to be people that are going to quit eventually. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we 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 love Keith still, you know, but uh, it it just obviously it was it was time for him to move on, and uh, you know, th- I think uh, having to replace anybody, especially for our band, we're we're known for horns and especially our trumpet, it was going to be difficult. And uh, Mark is a very he's a really cool and capable uh, guy, you know, he fits in really well. So. Cool. Yeah, and I trust you guys. I wasn't worried about that for a second. I was just surprised. I guess I should Wikipedia bands more often and see where they're sitting as time continues to speed up. <laughs> uh, I was a big fan of the, uh, the, the, re, the re-recording of Distress, and I wanted to talk about that just a, a little bit because as a 
teenager listening to quality softcore for the first time uh, and thinking the way teenagers think about music, uh, it led led me to believe that Distress was the first Mad Caddy song ever written, which is probably not true. Uh, but to hear that song revamped and re-recorded uh, with kind of your newer sound was, was really exciting. What kind of came about uh, deciding to do that? Um, I think that was, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I think it was because we still, we, we wanted to play some songs off of uh, Quality Softcore and songs like Distress, we, we liked the song, you know, the, the, the melody and, and, you know, the, the whole, we liked the song, but stylistically we thought it was a little dated, um, especially w within our live show, you know, like our live show, we, we kind of worked really hard at to make it kind of flowing and kind of fit and, and, you know, make the different genres of music kind of mesh together. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, a I'm kind of responsible for a lot of like the New Orleans reggae, the New Orleans punk rock kind of stuff. I'm usually okay. one of the guys that kind of gets it going and, and kind of comes up with like a, a basic idea for that genre. And so I just took that song and said, Hey, let's, you know, like let's try to play the song and, and just modify it a little bit for our live show. And then, you know, now we play it all the time and we play it at every show. And it, it, that, that style just fits in with obviously what the Mad Caddies became. And I still think it's, um, I don't think it, it's different, but I think it, most of the people tend to like it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, maybe at first they don't even recognize what song it is, but once it gets to the chorus, they're like, oh yeah, cool, you know? Oh, I was stoked. And, and of course, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put down the original version, but yeah, I mean, the original version is a, a little dinky and a little slow, and it is exactly what it was supposed to be. The new one is, you know, has some fire underneath it, so I can see how it would definitely fit in a set. And, yeah, it fits uh, in with our live show, you know, with, with all of our other songs that are kind of in that genre and the reggae stuff, it, I think it fits in really well. Now, as you referred to kind of the New Orleans style, uh, I kind of wanted to talk about where that came from for you. Uh, obviously, you've always been driven to uh, introduce as many different uh, vibes and, and instruments into into your songs. But that was one that, that was surprising for me as a fan uh, when it came in. Uh, I, I guess a, a little bit around, there was some stuff on Keep It Going, I guess they kind of uh, you know, focused on the dirge and that sort of stuff, but the piano heavy stuff really came in around Dirty Rice. Oh uh, yeah, well, I mean, ever since Monkeys, we've been doing New Orleans jazz, you know, kind of stuff. So, so ever since you know Duck and Cover, but yeah, uh, obviously we started. Uh, our good buddy Dustin Lanker started playing with us, and he's a great piano player, and he's really good at that genre of music. Um, he's by far the best guy in the band. He knows like all the chords and all that stuff. Most of us are just kind of you know, faking our way through it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we when when we were younger, we kind of wanted to do some other genres of music that had horns that we could, could kind of set us apart. And that genre, you know, we I was a fan of old you know old traditional bands like Fletcher Henderson and and Louis Armstrong and all those old twenties and thirties dance bands and bands from New Orleans and uh, also like the whole resurgence like the Scroll Nut Zippers and uh, Cherry Pop and Daddies and Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. That was going on a lot at the time when we were first starting out. Um, and we just thought it'd be cool to kind of, you know, to uh, incorporate some of that sound into our band and be, it'd be a little different. Because at the time, there was a lot of bands in LA, especially, that were kind of sounded really similar. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that's what's kept you guys relevant uh, to yeah, today and, as well. And as far as as far as you know, like we so on, like on Dirty Rice, we were like, all right, how can we? We did the fast version of that. So on Dirty Rice, we try to do kind of more mid tempo rock, but add in some of that New Orleans vibe as well. You know, instead of just no, the, I, fast, the fast kind of monkey stuff. So. No, I love it, and I think that uh, for for Chuck as a vocalist, I think that it opened up uh, another endless bucket of opportunity for you guys because he. Can, he can sing fast, he can sing hard, he can sing with soul, but when he's singing with soul with that piano behind him, it's an, an entirely different beast for you yeah, guys. Yeah, his voice is, not, you know, like, it, his voice will, 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 is going to be getting better for a long time, you know, the, the more he sings and it just, uh, it gets more you know, dirty and raspy, um, it gets more character to it, you know? So yeah. his, voice, his voice is going to be, be firing for a long time. Now I've watched, uh, 
I think you were kind of uh, your backdrop was like tour buses, but you did some kind of uh, somewhat acoustic eve performances uh, of different songs. Uh, just coming off of that, uh, during COVID, can, can we expect anything, any sort of performances from you guys? Yeah, uh, I think we're going to be doing some live streaming thing around the holidays. Uh, maybe a partially acoustic, partially electric. I'm not really sure, um, but yes, we've already we've already had the bulk, uh We have things set in motion to be doing something coming up. Cool. So um, I'm not. I can't say when that is. Ideally, like I said, I'd be. I, I think it would be cool to do something around the holidays. You know, maybe do a couple acoustic songs, like you know, holiday acoustic songs, and I don't know. But we're gonna come up with something cool. And then also perform some of the new songs, uh, and then maybe even by that time, even some brand new unreleased songs. Who knows? And yeah, and that's to be expected. Uh, unfortunately, with the majority of the artists that have released albums in 2020, uh, they're already gushing with new material. So I was kind of curious about that. Are you guys still actively uh, writing or practicing, rehearsing? I, I know for myself, I have like uh, probably at least 30 ideas over the last, well, I've, I've had hundreds of ideas, but I've narrowed it down to, I think a strong 30, just myself. And that's, and it's all uh, like, it's it's very kind of like a, if I could say anything, I'd say it's like, 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 a, like a keep it going, duck and cover kind of vibe. You know, it's pretty fast and there's a lot of, a lot of different genres, new genres, but you know, some kind of banda, like Mexican style stuff and some more New Orleans jazz and punk rock. And uh, like I said, I myself just have like 30 ideas. Yeah, so uh, like, That's I great. Think, like a, a new album, a full length is going to be, there's not going to be any shortage of ideas for it, you know? And I'm also not, in keeping with the mid tempo rock thing that we've done, I, you know, like we, any, any kind of thing that we get on, we don't, you know, we kind of change a little bit. so. I don't think the, the next one won't be similar to this one um, as far as the genres of music either. So, And that was going to be kind of my follow-up question for that is uh, there are, uh, there are no patterns in your, in your discography, uh, but there does seem to be kind of a wave where they say, Oh, well, we're going to touch on pirate music a little bit, or Oh, we're going to touch a little bit more on the new Orleans stuff. When you, when you say idea, um, and not to dig like super deep into your brain, but when you say idea, is it more, you know, I kind of want to, t to touch on this genre as much as we can and still keep it mad caddies. Uh, yeah. And are the themes relevant to the lyrical content as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think the lyrics, you know, I mean, the themes and the genres and the emotions that like of what's been coming out has been, I mean, especially with COVID, you know, there's definitely some more aggressive stuff, at least from my own, from my end of it, that mm. we haven't really had in a long time. Some pretty up tempo, aggressive, uh, mad caddy stuff that I kind of want to get off my chest. And um, like I said, I think it's just been a long time since we've had a group of we might have had one or two here or there, up to more up tempo ones. But I think in general, the new stuff is super high energy. It, it, it might not necessarily be punk rock or you know, reggae or ska or whatever, but it's all, it all is definitely very mad caddies and very high energy. Great. And I was a fan, uh, not only was I a fan of Chuck's solo record, was that called Elwood? Yeah. I was a fan of it, but I, I, it also enticed me as like a guy that plays in bands because I was able to kind of take that album and then say, okay, so that's where Chuck's songs start to fit into the mad caddies discography. Mm -hmm. uh, what w without yeah, without speaking for him was that project just a collection of his songs that had never become Mad Caddy songs or was it something entirely different? Uh, yeah, they were. I mean, I think some of them maybe originally were supposed to be Mad Caddy songs. Uh, at the time, I wasn't. Uh, I was the, gone for like a year, and um, in general, I you know, I said you. Know, everyone in this band is doing other other things or has other things on the table sometime. And it's, uh, it's, I've always said it's, it's good to not be just artistically just stuck with the mad caddies as far as that's all your only outlet for music. Yeah. And I, that's not healthy for, to, to 
because then that makes the mad caddies everything in certain times certain things like don't necessarily like I mean, there's even though it seems like we might include every genre of music into our band, I think we all agree there's certain things that don't fit that are, that you know that don't sound like Mad Caddies, you know. On my end too, though, like I wouldn't go too hardcore into the reggae stuff, um, you know. Like so, there's definitely like uh, genres that I think is better. Like it, it just doesn't make that like albums flow as well as they could, and so um, so yeah. So Chuck just took some time and some of the guys in our band and had some songs and then had written some new ones and just wanted to get something going. So it out. No, I enjoyed it very much. And I, I think that's a really good answer to you. Uh, you uh, your band is one of those bands that puts out records that are great. Uh, they don't, uh, it's, it's not, check out this new song, check out this new song, it's gonna be on the album. Album comes out, you hear the song that you're obsessed with and then you get to the rest of the record and you're like, okay. They wrote the, they wrote the songs that they, that we figured they would write, you know what I mean? Unfortunately, as as punk rock music gets older and older, uh, that can sadly become the norm. So, yeah, uh, any any band risks kind of getting, you know, just just get risks repeating the same thing that they do over and over again. And uh, I mean, that's great song occasionally, but not for whole albums. It just kind of it becomes it's not very fun, you know. <laughs> well, there was a time when, as a, a fan. Uh, Mad Caddies and all of the third wave, uh, you know, ska bands on the radio, at least for me, Rural Town, were, were parallels. And I, that's what was very exciting. I, I got to talk with Chris from Less Than Jake about it as well. Uh, suddenly, uh, you know, ska music became mainstream. And within six months, you guys released, uh, I think, that EP in 2000. And it was very obvious, like, oh, Mad Caddies aren't changing at all. Fuck you. Like, this is the way we sound, and we're not, you know, we might have horns, but it doesn't mean that we're following this weird train that happened to be intersecting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've done poppy stuff, but we've never, poppy horn stuff, but we've never really done very well. You know, like I said, we might have pop songs, but not in the same way that other bands like, you know, Real Big Fish uh, or the Boston's kind of had, like mid-tempo pop ska that's yeah. never, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to doing it, but it kind of never was, no songs were ever really written like that, so we just kind of never really did it, you know? Um, but, yeah, that's that's a good point. But, yeah, you're right. I, mean, that, I guess that would be kind of a statement, especially with some of the aggressive ones on that one. Yeah. That, that well, I think it's more of a, do that. it can be more of a, it's funny to look back that far as a listener, and just say, oh, I was wrong about this or I was wrong about that. But, uh, yeah, looking back at, an, at a band's discography that has horn players in it is an interesting thing to do when you start touching on, like, 98, 99. But, uh, and you had lived abroad for a long time, I had read, right? Uh, I mean, I was traveling to Jamaica a lot. Um, and then I lived in Montreal for about nine months. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've traveled around quite a bit. Met a lot of good friends from as a result of this band. So, you know, sometimes it's great to be able to go and just go to any city and you know somebody there, you know? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, I just played shitty punk music, but I'll, I'll never forget the first time I went on a real vacation, like with money in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and because the first thing my my now wife she took me to vegas and i'm like all right so what's the first free thing i'm gonna do and do i know anybody in this town well, that was, those are the first two things that popped up and <laughs> so when my my wife said no no we have we we have this money that we can spend to have fun at this place that we're at and it was a new idea for me because <laughs> it, used, it used to just be uh, find the people that you remember from the last time you were there and uh Try not to spend the thirty bucks you got in your pocket. So yeah, <laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, other than that, I, I just kind of wanted to talk about what's next uh, for you and and the Mad Caddies uh, coming forward, which is uh, kind of a difficult yeah. question given the time. But uh, what 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 do you guys have planned as far as tours? that got canceled that are hopefully going to get rescheduled at some point. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there, we had a, you know, there was, with, with the release of the EP and everything, there was obviously going to be festivals in Europe in the summer, and we had some one-offs that we were going to be doing. You know, the, things got canceled. We had those Flogging Molly shows that got canceled right at the beginning of it. We had about five, five or six shows of Flogging Molly, and, uh, you know, I know that at some point we were going to be looking into doing some more U.S. stuff, possibly East Coast, uh, Canada, you know. Um, so just like every other band, whenever whenever this shit's over, like everyone and their mother is going to be touring again. <laughs> I think it's yeah. going to be, it's going to be kind of have the reverse effect. It's going to be too many bands trying to tour, you know, to make up for all the money they lost. So who knows what's going to happen? I think even if this shit were to end tomorrow, it's still it's going to take a year to sort itself out. You know. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I do think people are going to be stoked to go to shows again, though. Yes, yes, for sure, with no money. But they'll be stoked to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's but I, true. I think uh, you know, as far as the band, I mean, as far as I can't speak with everybody, but me personally, I, I would say that you know, I've never, in general, you know, with music, whether it's other st other genre, other stuff that I do or Mad Caddy stuff, I've never had more music. Uh, ready to go and been wanting to work on music enough, you know. That's the one thing that we that uh, you know Todd, our drummer, he lives in Oregon. I'm in LA. Um, some of the guys are up in San Inez, California. We're all over, so we haven't during this COVID thing. We have not gotten together and had any practices or rehearsals and done any new music. Which I'm hoping that during the holidays we can get together and really start that because uh, there's just a ton of shit that we got to go through, you know. Ton of music. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. cobwebs and re reuniting and, and all of that too. Yeah, and, 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 and I almost feel in a way that it's kind of like starting over again, you know? I mean, before this EP was, you know, before this came out, I mean, it's not like I told you, some of these songs are like a couple of years old. So we were already kind of ready to put this thing out like a year ago. Mm -hmm. You know? And so we've, we have, it's not like we just wrote these songs, recorded them, and we're putting them out. These songs are still, you know, we're, we're happy with it, but. Dude, we had just so much other stuff, you know, like I said, between between the first delay and then between COVID, it's just been, you know, like I said, like, uh, I mean, with, with sonically how the EP sounds, I mean, like our drummer Todd, you know, he, he killed it and he just had all the time in the world to like go over, you know, just to tinker with things in his studio uh, and really just experiment and I'm sure he's learned a lot. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to the, to the next one because he's he, he is really learning a lot you know, in the last two albums that we've done uh, is really helping uh, helping out with the band as far as us being able to do a, be more, a more self-contained unit and uh, and do what we need to do, you know. Absolutely, yeah. You know, and uh, out of just pure Zoom interviews, uh, I got to talk to Propag Propagandy, Les and Jake, and uh, Bracket about their home recording. You know, they do it all themselves now, uh, mm -hmm. and it allows them to... Uh, be more adhesive as a group of individuals and friends that play music together, but also it allows you to decide exactly how you want your records to sound. So uh, if House on Fire is an example of sonically where you guys can go, then, I, you know, as a listener, sky's the limit. I'm super stoked for some more because it sounds very good. Cool, man. Thank you very much. But other than that, uh, I think that's about all I had for you. Uh, thanks for taking the time out. And, uh, yeah. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much.